everyone. Welcome back to the live stream studio here at Nordic Business Forum Norway 2019. This is the place to come if you want to catch out one-to-one -one interviews with some of the event's biggest speakers and other partners joining the event here in Oslo. My name is Maddie Savage. I'm your host throughout the day, and I'd like to introduce our first uh, guest for this session, uh, John Ekman from digital consulting firm Curamando, uh, one of the partners of this year's Nordic Business Forum. You were leading one of the breakout sessions over lunchtime, so yeah, I did. a few people uh, milling around the venue might have seen you, but most of the people watching online won't have had a chance to see that. So just give yeah. us a quick summary of, of what your focus was. I'm talking about digital transformation, and uh, I think, I guess the main theme of my presentation is that uh, I've actually had an attendee at a previous conference who came up and said, like, it was so interesting and so many insights, and I'm so happy I joined because I was barely I was, I was just on the brink of not joining because I'm so sick and tired of this subject of digital transformation. And that makes me a bit sad because I think it's very important. Uh, a lot of companies should pay attention to it, but we are already tired of it because there's just too much blah, blah, blah and uh, strategic umbrella terms uh, kind of thing. So um, therefore I coined, I named my presentation what is broken in digital transformation and how to fix it. Because I think it's important, but, but we're attacking it the wrong way. Um, so I was um, trying to give a more uh, hands-on practical tips of uh, uh, surviving this uh, uh, transformation stuff that we are talking about. So that was... Um, the topic for me. All right, yeah. so give us, a, give us a couple of these practical tips, because as you say, it's a very broad term. Everybody right. knows they yeah. need to think about exactly. being even more digital, but yeah. what can you do on a day-to-day -day basis or on an annual basis if you're in a company? Well, I, I, I start out with a, a kind of a problem analysis of what is actually broken. And uh, uh, I, I think that the first thing that, that is broken is I say that digital transformation itself is broken because uh, one of the problems that companies have in, 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 in the research that I've done and also in the practical day-to-day uh, -day work uh, uh, that I do as a partner at Curamando, um, uh, we get into uh, discussions with clients and we see that uh, when we get in working with them, that a, a lot of them, they're either not onto the digital transformation. Uh, they still think it's not for them. Uh, they, they've tried it and they failed. And, 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 and a lot of those companies, they are, they probably somewhere deep inside understand they need to get onto it. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's almost like um, if, you, if you think that you have a diagnosis for something bad, maybe you don't even call the doctor because you don't want to know the answer, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so they're, they're not getting into it because they're afraid of what the answer would be. But if they are trying to get into it, then they, they attack it in the way of setting digital transformation as an overall goal. So the goal, our, our business goal for the next two years is to become digitally transformed. But that's actually the wrong way of doing it because when you're setting it as a goal, everything you do which is like remotely connected to digital transformation, like installing uh, digital uh, toilet paper dispensers in your loo's would be leading you towards that goal. So uh, I would argue that most companies need to see the goal of their activities as the goals that we always had. Uh, happy customers, happy staff, uh, efficient supply chain management and those. And we use the latest digital tools and when we do that, as a result and not as a goal, we will become digitally transformed. So the companies are kind of attacking it the wrong way around. So mm. that, 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 that's at the core of it, I would say. So looking ahead to what you want to be as a business and how digital can fit into that rather than, oh, let's cherry pick this digital thing, that digital right. thing. Okay, that makes, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, what would you say the most common mistakes are apart from the sticking your head in the sand analogy that you referred to, <laughs> yeah, people yeah. just saying, oh, we know we've got to do it, but, but we can't. What, what would you say the other common errors are? Well, I, I get... Um, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm a kind of a practical person myself, so I, I work a, a lot with uh, managers and, and the people that, that get to do the, the everyday stuff. And what, uh, the, the, the feedback that I get from a lot of those people is that they don't see how their work is connected to the overall picture. So there's a, I, I, um, I'm, I, I'm using the analogy, which I borrowed from a dear friend of mine called Andre Morris at Kommissionskraft in Germany. Um, and he, it's like an office building where you have a top floor with the executives where they crave for digital transformation. And then at the bottom layer, there are all the people running around like crazy and they are doing digital transformation. But the problem with this office building is they forgot to put in the elevators and the ventilation ducts in the middle floor. So there's a, there's a huge, well, if you, if you look back some years, there, there's the, the term digital divide. 
uh, uh, the digital divide, we use that term for talking about people who, are, who have the digital and for those who haven't, on a, like an individual level. They, like, uh, rich people have it, poor people that live in trailer parks, they don't have it. Uh, but now there's a new digital divide inside the companies. It's a digital divide between the management who want it, who need it, but don't understand it that much, and then the people who are actually doing it, who do understand it, but they don't understand how, how does my little, my Google Analytics-based KPI, how does that connect to the bigger picture? I would say that connecting these, uh, 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 these flaws in this office building, uh, that is the, the single most important thing uh, uh, to do. There's, this, there's, there's also a second, but we'll get to that. <laughs> How much does the digital, the classic digital divide still exist? I mean, most of us entering the workforce now have grown yeah. up in a digital world. Most people that have been in the workforce for 10, 15 years have, yeah. have learned to use digital tools. But with things like AI, machine learning, coding, we're starting to see new digital divides between people who are absolute experts in these areas and people that don't have a clue. Uh, so, so you're saying that there's a zero digital, old digital, and new digital. Is that I'm, is I mean, something I'm, like I'm, that? I'm, ask, I'm asking you that it's something that we, you know, conversations and debates uh, around AI are yeah. starting to include. Is this a new digital, digital divide? Should I be learning how to code, or should I be leaving it up to the experts? And you're saying that even in, within management, there are sort of managers saying, "Well, I know I need to be digital. I know I need to look at these new technologies," but. I don't necessarily understand them. So I'm just wondering if we might be heading towards new divisions or what companies might be able to do yeah, to yeah, mitigate yeah, that. Yeah, we, we are probably heading towards that. And, and uh, I mean, that, <clears throat> this is a, very much a cliche and, and this about like lifelong learning and all those things. I didn't talk too much about that in my talk because I think it's a, it's, a, it's like a no-brainer. It's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's very easy to not, to not get round to, to be exhausted after oh, your day course, at work yeah, and yeah. You know, just watch TV, Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's also something. That when you talk about being digital, that I, I think there's also a, a, a problem with, with people who are perceiving themselves as digital, but they are actually digital consumers. Just because you watch Netflix all day long doesn't mean that you do understand all the digital tools that you need to have at, your, at work. You, can, you might understand what it's like to be a media consumer on Instagram. Uh, and, and, how that, and to translate that into highly successful Instagram advertising strategies is, isn't actually the same thing. Yeah. OK, let's talk about um, advertising, conversions, turning engagement right. into sales and revenue. Yeah. Well, I, um, I, found, I, I founded a company called Conversionista. Uh, so that's the, the number one conversion agency uh, for conversion optimization here, here in the Nordics. Uh, that was acquired by Curamando two years ago. So uh, that is pretty much my, my background. So I started the company myself, and we're now 50 employees in, in the Nordics. Uh, so I, I more or less built my career on, on, uh, on that. And uh, in, uh, I think the three key components in, in my work and what everybody needs to get who, who is interested in, in turning engagement into, into, in, in, into, into sales, into money, yeah, exactly. It's a, we, we need to understand three things. We need to, first of all, uh, understand data. And like Avinash Karshi was, was uh, talking about, uh, which unfortunately often turns into, he called it data puking, with, with uh, how Google Analytics used to work. Uh, so we need to understand the data, but the data only gives us the, the, the what, the, what is going on. And, and the second component is to understand why consumers are behaving in the way that they do. And then we need to, we need to marry uh, the quantitative data with understanding about the, hum about the human brain, about behavior psychology, uh, about this huge field uh, called behavior economics, uh, and understanding our irrational patterns as, as consumers. Um, and when you marry these two, uh, you understand the, the data of, of how people behave, and you understand why they do it. And now we can form hypotheses, which we turn into experiments. So uh, more or less, um, the, the key three components of, of doing this is seeing the data, understanding the, the human behavior, and, and validating whatever it is you want to do with, with in, a, in an experimental way. Do you have any good case studies of, of companies that had, had struggled to take on those concepts and, and have since converted really well? Yeah, I, 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 I would say that um, some, of, not, not all of us, but some of the clients that, that we meet with, they, they go into something we call alibi testing. 
which is that they have seen, they've been to a conference, they've read a book, they're, they're psyched about this thing called A-B testing or experimentation or growth hacking or something like that. So now they want to do that at scale. So, so they buy a, a, a new set of tools and they hire people. So they build up a, this, an engine to scale this. Uh, but the problem is that uh, they don't actually have the, the, the quality and they don't have the qualitative insights um, uh, in, in the work that they do. So they are basically, it becomes a much bigger uh, machine and faster acting machine for like garbage in, garbage out. So, so a, a lot of companies, unfortunately, they don't spend the time they should be spending with the customers, with qualitative insights, and, and all these things about understanding the human's psychology that, that is overlooked. Uh, Okay. So, so that's that's um, that's something which uh, which a lot of companies unfortunately are are struggling with. Which companies are inspirational? Which ones have done well? Well, it's 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 almost like you know it's, it's kind of boring. But the but the the companies that are obsessed about validating validating everything they do, it's like the, the, these cases that cases that we heard about, uh, like Booking and Amazon, I guess, are the are the world leaders in number of experiments that. Uh, uh, that they do, they, they are highly based on uh, like everything that you, n everything new that you want to propose, that you want to do, that you want to change. You want you have to prove it with experimentation. If you can't prove it with experimentation, it basically doesn't go out. It, it, and then, so they have this kind of culture. And also, what needs to be in that culture is uh, the uh, high acceptance for failing. So it is the, the, the only like in that in that company the only fail is to not be experimenting mm. to be producing an experiment which didn't deliver a result that's not failing that's that's experimenting it's part of what we do yeah, yeah. experimentation and, and innovation are there any cool new tools and tech that you can see coming in in this in this realm in the in the coming months and years well, like Avinash spoke a lot about about machine learning and, and AI and, and of course there's a the, especially on the on the advertising side, uh, uh, side in in the ad tech martech space, there there's uh, tons of interesting uh, stuff going on in programmatic buying and and all that. Uh, if if you're looking at if if you separate the world between like how do you how do you advertise and drive traffic to a website, for example, and then what do you do with your audience once they arrive on the website? Um, unfortunately, here in the Nordics, a lot of companies. They just don't have the, the, the enough amount of data on their website. So if we want to experiment at scale and we want to have statistically significant results uh, for our various hypotheses, just very few organizations that, that has, has the, the, just the, number, the sheer amount of visitors and numbers of customers. Are you saying uh, that they don't get enough traffic because it's a smaller market or they don't know how to Yeah, because get the, that the market data. is smaller. Yeah. We, we just don't have... If you're looking at the, the kind of experimentation, for example, that Amazon can do, well, of course they can do because they have like millions of customers globally. So they can do, uh, it, it means that if you want to try this little tweak and we only see a signal of a couple of percentage points uh, change, like they can detect that signal across millions of users. If you have like uh, 2,000 users, then to be able to detect that kind of small signal, it's just, it doesn't, for, you know, if you're using the statistical frameworks for, for seeing that, it's, it's, it's going to say it could be an effect or it could just be a statistical fluke, you know? Mm, interesting, especially since we've had um, a few people uh, that we've been speaking to today mentioning that a key thing for people working in the Nordics is to try and grow outside the Nordics. It, it really should be in your mindset from the beginning to try and get right. that bigger audience right. base. But if you are just having a couple of thousand customers, you, you still need to get your hands on that data before you take that next step, I suppose. Uh, but I also must say that, that the answer to that question was in the context of new cool tools. And new cool tools, a lot of them are based on AI, deep learning, which a, a lot of those platforms, what they, what they uh, in the end, at, at least for all the customer base, they need a lot of data. Mm. So, but then you, if you don't have that amount of data, then you can work with other tools, uh, which is just, there's there, just very simple practices that a lot of companies can do. It's just what we call like guerrilla testing. You know, you, you basically, I have a new prototype. I put it on my laptop. I go down to the nearest cafe. I give a, a couple of people a, 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 a voucher for some coffee cups. Classic and, yeah. market research. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so that, that is a classical but still underutilized tool that a lot of companies could do. Do you think go. people are so obsessed with being digital and, and using all these new tools, they sometimes lack just the going and speaking to ordinary people approach, the qualitative data. I mean, you're somebody that works with data, but then you're also saying, actually, sometimes these old school strategies can work as well. Yeah, 
Maybe, maybe there's so much new that <laughs> we're trying to learn the new, we forget some of the old. There, there's a, there's a, one of my colleagues in the, in the business, Els Arts from, from uh, uh, Belgium, who's a fantastic uh, speaker on, on user research and so on. Her latest talk, uh, which is going to uh, have a conference on my own, she's going to talk there. It's called The, the Lost Start of Asking Questions. Uh, and um, so, when you when you ask questions, you can ask them in different ways, and 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 just that that that, that body of knowledge has been there forever. But but now we are in in our new world. Uh, just, just look at yourself when you're in, you're interacting with with uh, brands, and they're like, could we ask you about your brand experience? And and they're they're asking you that like companies are asking a lot more questions now, but but the art of formulating, phrasing, and structuring those questions so you get the right answers. That, that, that's been known for years, but still a lot of companies now that they start asking more questions, they don't get the basics right about how you actually ask questions. So, so, um, so there's definitely some stuff which is lost and need to be refound and <laughs> reused. Yeah. yeah, so merging the physical, the analog, the digital, and yeah. communication, I guess. Um, any other future trends that you're interested in, either either in this industry or in the in the broader business sense? I I I'm, I'm personally now uh, uh, working on a on this. I've, I've gotten myself now into this whole business of the uh, digital transformation. Uh, I'm doing some some really interesting research work and, and working deeper with our clients to understand that a lot better. And I I think that a, a, a very interesting arena is to understanding the. Um, the organizational psychology, organizational behavior, uh, in the in the perspective of, of um, um, like the collective. So now I'm getting confused. There, uh, we are talking about something called uh, cognitive biases and irrational uh, patterns that are, that we uh, that we show on a, on an individual consumer level. Uh, but I'm very curious right now about the, how the collective, in, in the, if you take up, roll up all the individual cognitive biases into like a collective cognitive biases, how does that limit our decision making on an organizational level? Uh, so that's something which I'm personally what, looking into right now. What kind of collective biases might you be referring to? Well, well look at, uh, if you look at um, <clears throat> consumers, for example, there's a very well-known factor called loss aversion. Uh, loss aversion uh, fact is that if I ask you if I can, if, I, if you would like 10 euros from me, you'd probably say yes. If I can take t tw 10 euros out of your purse, that's a totally different question. And it's by a factor two. So it's, for you, it's equal to get 10 euros or if I take, uh, or to get 20 euros or if I take 10 euros out of your purse. It's a, it's a factor 2x. That's called loss aversion. Now, the whole thing about digital transformation, why, why organizations are stumbling and, and fearing and getting into this, uh, I would say that that's loss aversion on an organizational level. Mm. The, the companies are afraid of letting go of the past. They're afraid of people taking 10 euros out of their wallet, even though there's 10 more new euros to be made out there. So, uh, so we t if we take those biases and we look at them on an organizational level, I think that's a, a very interesting topic that I've become very interested in, in lately. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. Organizational culture and also the, the classic fear factor of, of, of change. Yeah. Uh, one very final Final quick reflection, Kuramando is, is a partner of Nordic yeah. Business Forum. How's it been for you guys being uh, here in Oslo? Uh, we, had a, we had a fantastic attendance at the breakout session that we did. So it was, it was uh, just a couple of minutes before we started, it was always nobody there, but then people rushed in, the room was full. So uh, fantastic energy being able to speak here. Uh, and we have a stand uh, down here where people can go and do our digital maturity assessment and have the chance to win a, a Harman Kardon speaker with a Google Assistant in it. So, so we've seen some people stopping by there. So, it's, so, so we've, we've, had a, we've had a good time here. Lots of engagement. Lots of people talking about the energy yeah, here yeah, at Nordic yeah, Business Forum yeah. this year, which is, which is great. Thanks very much, John Eklund, partner at Curamando. Pleasure yep, speaking you. to you. We need you to pop uh, right. away from your uh, spot there as we prepare for our next guest, which is someone that I know a lot of you have been waiting for. If you're just joining us, uh, watching the live stream at home, online, or on your mobile device, wherever you're watching, welcome. It's fantastic to speak to you. I'm Maddie Savage, hosting all of the sessions here. And hello to all of you uh, watching us live in person here in Oslo. So, uh, our final guest of the day here uh, is also going to be closing on the main stage uh, in a couple of uh, hours. And he stopped by the studio uh, for a quick interview first. Hello, Simon Sinek. Hello, uh, how are you? Very well, thank you. World renowned leadership expert and best selling author. 
you're going to be speaking about your upcoming book, The Infinite Game. Uh, don't give too much away, but I'd like a bit of a flavor of what people can expect in your keynote. So, uh, very simply, um, we are uh, players in games that have no finish lines. You know, there's no such thing as winning marriage, there's no such thing as winning global politics, and there's definitely no such thing as winning business. Um, and if you listen to the language of too many leaders, they don't know the game they're in. They talk about being number one, being the best, and beating their competition. But there's no agreed upon metrics and there's no agreed upon timeframes. In other words, there's no such thing as winning. So the problem is, is when we lead with a finite mindset in the infinite game, there's a few very predictable and consistent outcomes. The decline in trust, the decline in cooperation, and the decline in innovation. So if we need to learn to adjust our mindset to lead for the game we're actually playing in, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, and so a lot of it's also about at playing our own game on our own terms. It's about playing the game that we're actually in. So you can't show up to play, uh, uh, you can't show up for a football game if you've been practicing basketball. It's not going to go well. Okay, very much looking forward to hearing more about this. We're going to talk a little bit uh, now about you and some of your previous work. Uh, a lot of the speakers here have been talking about millennials and also Generation uh, Z. Uh, you gave a famous interview about millennials a couple of years ago. It's very heavily watched online, but not everyone will have, um, will have heard it or seen it. But uh, something you talked about was perhaps millennials having lost a bit of their way when it comes to wanting to make an impact, yeah. wanting to do that immediately. and. Yeah, essentially just being a little bit impatient. Yeah. Tell us more about those thoughts. I, one of the things that I love about this millennial generation is they, um, you know, I think very often that people say that they, they're driven by purpose and they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Everybody wants that. Everybody's driven by purpose and everybody wants to be a part of something. It's one of the themes of this event. Right, purpose. everybody wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Millennials are just more vocal about it. Mm. You know, older generations just suffer in silence. And I love that. I love that they're open about that. What they, what they forgot, though, that is to, to, to devote one's life to some sense of purpose is, is a lifelong pursuit. It's something that is unachievable in a day or a week or even a year or even if a few years. And, uh, and they, they speak in very vague terms to many about, I want to make an impact. I want to work for a company that makes an impact. They're like, yeah, but what kind of impact? Mm. You know? Um, th there's not one thing. So I think one of the things that helps people find a place where they can feel like they're making an impact and they feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves is we ourselves have to know the exact specific kind of impact we want to make. Something uh, not, not general, because um, who knows what that means. Okay, well that links into a lot of your other work is how do you find that? How do you figure that out? So uh, every single one of us is a product of our own upbringings. Um, uh, we are the products of how we were raised, the experiences we had when we were younger, and that makes us who we are. Um, and the nice thing is, is when we are operating at our natural best, uh, there's a series of patterns that emerge, and those patterns are identifiable. In other words, if we identify the patterns of how we operate when we operate at our natural best, we can be more prescriptive about the environments in which we work and, and the things we want to pursue. This is what I talk about when I talk about finding your why, mm. which is really about understanding who you are and where you're from and, and how you do your best natural work. Most of us, unfortunately, live our lives by accident. You know, sometimes we're in the flow and sometimes we're not, but we don't exactly know how to turn it on and turn it off. The ability to identify those patterns and identify one's why means we can increase the likelihood that we can be in that state of flow way more often. Is that a luxury that people have if they've already made their money in a career, they've got a stable partner which is bringing in the other side of the income, for example? If you're just starting out and you just need a paycheck, do you really have the space to, to think about that and how should you make so that the space? Question, the question is, is joy only reserved for people with money? Well, that oh, wasn't the not. question, but, but how, how, do people, how do people get there and what practical steps can they take? So. Um, the, the good news is, is, of course not. It's not something that is only restricted to people who have money. And in fact, people who sometimes have money who have made it don't have this. They, they actually might have higher stress. Um, so uh, for young people and people who are starting their careers, it's not just taking a job that pays them the most, but it's learning the skills of leadership that'll help put them on the right path. Learning to ask for help, that's a hard one. Mm. You know, learning to listen which is different than hearing or waiting for your turn to speak. That's a hard one. Mm -hmm. Learning to give feedback, learning to receive feedback. That's a hard one. So if you start learning the skills of leadership when you're young, um, you're more likely to uh, develop into the, the kind of leader that you want to be and that you wish you had. 
Okay, so great segue into being a good leader, something else that you've focused on in a lot of your work, and the idea that you need to be a giving leader, that you need to be helping your employees and, and almost self-sacrificing, really. Tell us a bit about your thoughts around that and how you came to those conclusions. So leadership is not a rank. It's not a position. Uh, and I think we very often confuse the... The, the promotion that we've had makes us a leader. No, it doesn't. That just gives you authority and gives you a title. Uh, uh, leadership is a responsibility, and it's the responsibility to see that those around us rise. That's what it is. Um, the closest analogy to what good leadership looks like is good parenting. You know, you don't get to choose your children. You sometimes don't get to choose your team, mm. and yet you have to love them. Mm. Right? That's just what it means to be a parent, right? And you some don't of, have to love your boss. You don't, and everyone's probably had a bad boss. You don't have to love your boss, but your boss has to love you. Mm. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and many uh, people in positions of leadership have the trust relationship backwards. They say to their employees, prove to me why I should trust you. Nope, that's not how it works. A leader has to take the risk of trust, and they actually have to earn the trust of their subordinates. It's the other way around. Leaders earn trust, but they have to give it freely. Um, leadership is a skill, can be learned by anybody. Uh, everybody has the capacity to be a leader. Doesn't mean everybody wants to be a leader. Doesn't mean everybody should be a leader. Just like everybody has the capacity to be a parent. Doesn't mean everybody wants to be a parent or should be a parent. And so the first criterion to being a leader is you have to want to be one. Mm. It can sometimes be lonely. It can sometimes uh, uh, be frustrating. Uh, it sometimes can be thankless. Uh, it comes with personal sacrifice. Sometimes we have to put our interests aside for the good of our team. That's what it means to be a leader. If you don't want to do any of those things, then, then don't become a leader, just like you wouldn't become a parent. Mm, I mean, maybe that fits into the, the why aspect of things, because a lot of people end up becoming leaders. You get to the point in your career where you've, you've got to the point where you can be your most creative or your, your, your most senior position, and you have to if you want to make more money or you feel like you need to take that next step on the hierarchy, it feels natural, even if it doesn't feel natural to you, I suppose. So what would you say to people that have ended up in leadership roles and, and that's not where they feel they should be? Well, I know many people who sometimes uh, turn down a promotion. Um, they, they make a ton of money, uh, they're at the top of their game, and yet they're just so unhappy. And they were so much happier when they were in the trenches doing the work, being the engineer, mm. like whatever it was that got them their promotions because they're good at their job. And I've met many people who walked away from that senior job to take a more junior job. And though they say, I make less money, I've never been happier. Mm. And, uh, and so, you know, if the opportunity in our lives is to find joy and excel at what we do, because we feel good when we're good at what we do, then sometimes it comes at a cost. Mm. Everything comes at a price. There's nothing for free. And so sometimes for somebody to find joy at a more junior position means maybe sacrificing money. Mm. But for somebody who takes a position of leadership, though they, though they make more money, they sacrifice many other things, time. Leadership is, is, is a 24-7 job. Mm. You don't get to be a leader at work and not be a leader at, uh, uh, when you leave work. You are a leader all the time, whether you're actively engaged in it or not. So I think people think that every, some things come for free, ain't nothing for free. Yeah, and people often describe if they do that as, as brave, but what you're saying is it's essentially sensible because you're just it's, looking after your own happiness. It's, it's, it's really putting yourself in a position of joy and strength, and it's the kind of cost you'd be willing to, to bear. Mm. Um, there's gonna be a cost for every decision we make. The question is, what is it worth to us? Mm. So what about the people that have stayed in leadership then? And as you say, that this is a position in, in work and in your career where you need to make sacrifices. Yeah. How does that fit into all of the trends that we're being fed now about self-care, switching off, making sure that you, you know, you're not giving everything 100% all of the time and working 100 hours a week. But if you're the leader, don't you need to be on call in your spare time? Don't you need to be kind of on the coal face as well? So there's a paradox in being a human. There's also a paradox in being a leader. Um, which is at every moment of every day, we are both individuals and members of groups. Mm. And every day we are faced with decisions. Do I put my interest aside at the sacrifice of the group or do I put the group interest aside at the sacrifice of myself? And the answer is yes. It's not one or, it's one and. And so, you know, there's a debate. Should we wait? Yeah, we'll just oh, wait we for this to... 
So there's I a debate. So. Some people have a school of thought where they think, no, you have to put yourself first because how can you take care of the group unless you take care of yourself first? Mm -hmm. And other people say, no, 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 you have to take care of the group first because if you take care of the group, they'll take care of you. The answer is you're both right, you're both right and you're both wrong. I wish it were easy. Mm -hmm. This is why leadership is difficult. This is why the choices we make are difficult. This is why sacrifices have to happen both in both directions. And this is the art of leadership. Yes, there's a science to it as well, but the art of it comes with practice. We get better at it the more we practice, like we get better at anything the more we practice. And so for someone who finds themselves in a position of leadership, they have to become students of leadership and they have to practice leadership. Okay, so what are some good practices? Listening. There's a difference between listening and waiting for your turn to speak. Mm. Um, there's a difference between listening and hearing all the words. Listening is about making other people feel heard. It's about attempting to understand the meaning and the reason why somebody has the opinion that they have rather than just immediately agreeing or disagreeing. Leaders need to learn to listen. Empathy, the practice of empathy, very hard, totally learnable. I'll give you an example of what empathy looks like in the workspace. It's very common for a leader to walk into somebody's office and say, you've missed your numbers for the third quarter in a row. If you don't make your numbers the next quarter, I don't know what's gonna happen. That's pretty normal. Mm. Here's what that scene would look like if empathy were applied. You've missed your numbers for the third quarter in a row. Are you okay? I'm worried about you. What's going on? Wouldn't everyone love to have a boss like that? But that's what empathy <laughs> looks like. Mm. Um, uh, giving somebody the opportunity to fall and pick up and try again as opposed to swooping in and just doing their job for them. Letting them do things their own way. Um, in, in eliminating questions. Can I do this? And rather implement a, a system where they say, I intend. I intend to do this. So they take ownership of their actions. Uh, and the accountability as well. Um, the, the, these are, it's like getting into shape. It's like going to the gym. There's no f list of five things I can tell you, but you have to do all of them. And the problem is it's learning to do all of these things consistently. Okay. How does it work for you? I don't know how much of a one-man band you are, how big a team you've got behind you. How does leadership feed into your work? I continue to be a student of leadership. Um, I strive to be a better leader than I am every day. I make many, many mistakes. Um, I'm very lucky that we've built a team where um, we can be honest with each other, both formally, we create formal feedback sessions in which we expect open and honest feedback, and there's also uh, informal opportunities where somebody will say to me, You're, you were being an ass in that meeting, or you weren't listening, or you interrupted, and sometimes I'm aware of it and sometimes I'm not, usually I'm not. And it's, it helps me be a better leader because I have other people watching out for me, just like I'm trying to watch out for them. None of us is good by ourselves. We all have blind spots. And if our team, if we don't care about our team, our team, our team doesn't care about us. I'm very, very lucky that I, I have a, an amazing group of people that I get to work with and call my colleagues that, um, uh, that really want to help me be a better leader just as much as I want to help them do the same. What are your coping mechanisms when things don't go to plan? I, alcohol and cocaine, I find work. <laughs> you are speaking to a journalist. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, for me, it's about, uh, it's about finding space to do things that, uh, that really bring me joy. So my coping mechanisms, number one, are asking for help. You know, I, 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 I'm fully aware that, um, that I'm much better at dealing with stress if I call up somebody and say, I'm struggling. To say those words, I'm struggling, can you help me? I'm stuck. I, it's, for some people find that humiliating, but I think once you do it the first, you know, two, three, five times, it becomes a lot easier, and I, I don't think I would be able to get through half some of the, the stressful situations I would have without being able to call somebody for help. How do you identify who that person should be? How do you know who your friends are? You know, some of it's trial and error, and some of it's a feeling. You know, we're social animals, we're highly attuned social animals, and we're good at assessing uh, at people. Some of us trust too soon, some of us trust, you know, take a little longer to trust. Both come with liabilities. Mm -hmm. You trust too quickly, sometimes you get disappointed more. You trust too slowly, sometimes you don't have the people there when you need them. Yeah. It's not right or wrong, it's about finding the balance. Um, but I, I've, I've, I've learned to, cult to cultivate relationships. Of course I've made mistakes, sometimes I've trusted too soon. But you know, when, when somebody is there for you, then you go back to them again. Okay, and what about when you're striving for the next step? Is there anyone that has inspired you or, or mentored you or provided inspiration in, in text form for you? Oh, absolutely. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a long list of people that I, that I lean on and turn to for inspiration. Uh, George Flynn, who wrote the foreword to my book, Leaders Eat Last, has become a dear friend and mentor. My friend Ron Bruder, dear friend and mentor. My friend Mike Drowley, Laurie Robinson, um, uh, Bob Chapman, 
Um, these people are inspirations in how they lead. I, I, I look to them for examples on how to lead. I listen to their stories about how they dealt with difficult situations. And sometimes when they overreact or underreact, it, it makes me feel human as well, that, mm. that, that if they make mistakes, that means I can make mistakes too. <laughs> um, but I have a long list of people that I, I admire deeply and call for help on a regular basis. Do you think everyone needs a mentor? I think uh, everybody needs somebody we can turn to, yes. I think there's a big misunderstanding about who mentors are and, and how they come to be. Mentors are like friends. You, know, you don't get to go up to a random stranger and say, can we be friends? Like, that's not, that's not how it works. If you do, they probably yeah, say Yeah, it's no. weird. <laughs> um, uh, but that's unfortunately how many people treat mentors, mm -hmm. which is, will you be my mentor? Mm -hmm. I love your work. Will you be my mentor? I'm like... I don't even know you, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, it's at work as well. We have mentor programs. We assign you to be the mentor for them. That's not how it works. Uh, mentorship, uh, mentor relationships evolve like friendships evolve. So my mentors, for example, uh, I have a definition of a mentor. A mentor is somebody who always has time for you. Mm -hmm. So the way my mentor relationships evolved is there was somebody that I admired. I didn't ever ask them to be my mentor, but I wanted to call them and ask them for advice, and they took my call. And they gave me advice. And then a month later, I called them again. And they took my call again. And eventually, like friendship, this relationship evolved. And I discovered something magical. Oh, I have to stop. Is what a minute on the clock. Oh. That was supposed to be a subtle signal, oh. but you've given it away to the room. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, some, I, I learned this. You know, I, I was leaving the house of one of my mentors, Ron Bruder. And I remember putting my arm around him, and I said for the very first time, I used that word for the very first time, I said, I, I'm so glad you're my mentor. And he replied, and I'm so glad you're mine. And that's when I realized true mentor relationships, both people are the students and both people are the teachers. What a nice end note. Thank you very much to Simon Sinek. He's going to be on the main stage shortly. I know there's a huge crowd of people already here waiting to see him. So thanks very much for joining us here. Thanks, thanks very much me. to all of you uh, watching on the live stream. It's been great uh, to have so many of you getting engaged throughout the day. I'm Maddie Savage, and it's goodbye for now from Nordic Business Forum Norway 2019.